Welcome everybody um, to the second Canner Forum of the 21-22 academic year. I'm Ursula Heise, the chair of the Department of English, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. Um, we begin all public events that the department offers with an acknowledgement of um, the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin. It's my particular pleasure today to um, turn over these acknowledgements to Erin Davenport from American Indian Studies. Erin? Thank you so much, Ursula, and greetings, everyone. The AISC and UCLA acknowledge the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands, and are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarahatom indigenous peoples in this place. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to Honuk Vetam, the ancestors, Ahirehirom, the elders, and Eyuhinkem, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Thank you so much, Erin. And um, I just want to add that these acknowledgements always feel a little strange when we're in a Zoom meeting together, because many of us are actually in different locations, um, some of us outside of Los Angeles. But, um, but many of the places from which people log on, of course, share with Los Angeles a history of dispossession of indigenous peoples. And um, that, I think, makes it all the more important in an event like this to um, acknowledge their prior inhabitation and stewardship from the land or whichever land we venture from into digital space. Um, so let me just uh, say a few words about the Canner Forum. It originated in a significant set of gifts um, by Penny and Ed Canner um, that aimed to enrich the intellectual environment of the campus and the community at large. Um, the Canner's philanthropy produced a, a large range of continuing resources for faculty and graduate students at UCLA. And some of you might be familiar with some of them, the Penny and Ed Canner Prize Fund, the Penny Canner Dissertation Award, uh, the Penny Canner Endowed Chair in Women's Studies, which is located in the Center for the Study of Women, the Penny Canner Fellowship in British Studies at the Clark Memorial Library, and the Canner Forum, which is housed in the English department. So what the Canner Forum wants to do is promote dialogue about the current condition and the future of literary and cultural studies. Um, and it places the emphasis on exploring and engaging with new theoretical paradigms and critical um, perspectives in humanistic scholarship. So it's an annual series that brings distinguished scholars to UCLA, um, each of whom pursues a different articulation of literature's critical purchase and um, seeks to expand the parameters of literary discourse to include new and sometimes unexpected engagements with cultural, archival, and historical materials. I'm very grateful to the English Department of Speakers Planning Committee, um, which came up with the topic of this year's series of forums, which is literature and political activism. Our speaker today will be introduced and our discussion will be moderated by my colleague, Hoesta Moihane, who is assistant professor of English here at UCLA. Their work considers the intersections of decoloniality, sexuality, and ecology in the indigenous literatures of North America. Hoesta has published on queer indigenous literatures, on indigenous speculative fiction, one of my favorites, um, and on settler cinema. Their first book project examines how indigenous writers respond to the biopolitics of the settler imperial city. Hoesta, thank you so much for taking on the task of introducing our distinguished speaker today and moderating the discussion. Um, hello everyone uh, and welcome again. Um, it's my delight to um, uh, be part of this event hosting um, Leanne, and I'll just briefly introduce um, Leanne. Uh, Leanne Bida Samose Simpson um, is a Michi Sagik Nishinabek scholar, writer, musician, and member of the Alderville First Nation. Uh, she is author of seven previous books, uh, including the newly released A Short History of the Blockade, uh, simply astounding, beautiful work, um, as well as the novel Nukaming, A Cure for White Ladies, uh, a really, really powerful, just transcendent uh, piece, um, which was released uh, last year by um, the University of Minnesota Press in the United States, and then also um, released in Canada uh, as well. Um, Leanne has also released four uh, musical albums, uh, including Flight uh, and the Nukaming Sessions. Uh, and she also has a new work, um, the Polaris Shortlisted, uh, a collection piece called The Theory of Ice, 
Um, and her latest co-authored work uh, with Robert Maynard uh, is entitled Rehearsals for Living, uh, and it's forthcoming um, from Haymarket Books in June of 2022. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Leanne Simpson uh, to the Cantor Forum. And uh, I, I believe I will turn it over uh, to Leanne. Miigwech, hoesta, uh, for those kind, kind words. Ani kinawaya, girigabajuna denawema, kinagachi anishnabek ogawing nadonjaba, nagojawani me guadoda, bidas musa nadijnakaz, nagichi nendam mayayan. I'm so excited and honored to be to be here tonight, uh, tonight for me, I guess, afternoon for you, um, sharing my work, uh, Nopaming the Cure for White Ladies. And so, um, Chris, can we start the slides? Um, I'm Michi Sagik in Ishnabek, and our territory is on the North Shore of Lake Ontario, roughly between the cities of Toronto and Ottawa. And um, this is a shot of the bush or Nofuming about three blocks from my house. Um, this is what my land looks like. This is not what my land looks like right now. We have 40 inches of snow and it's about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a little different right now. But this is um, this is sort of the birthplace of, of Nopaming. So I wanted to start today by sort of sharing this, this photo of um, the land and all of the relationships that inform it um, in my home in Peterborough, Ontario, because this is the place that I have been um, during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I've just finished writing a book that Hoesta mentioned in their introduction with um, Robin Maynard, who is a Black feminist scholar, community organizer. Um, and our book is called Rehearsals for Living. Um, it's coming out in the US uh, by in June of uh, 2022, um, Haymarket Press is putting it out. And Robin and I wrote letters back and forth through the overlapping crises of the pandemic, ecological disaster, racial capitalism, and of course, through the global uprising for black life. Um, in these letters, we asked uh, each other sort of what deliberated lands, minds, and bodies look like. And so this project grew out of uh, those letters as we think with and alongside each other. And we're both sort of dorky scholars. So our letters actually have <laughs> tons of, of footnotes and endnotes. Um, Ruthie Wilson Gilmore wrote a foreword and Robin DJ Kelly wrote an afterword. So I'm excited about, uh, about this book coming out. The cover art, this is the first time that I revealed the cover, this is the cover reveal. Um, the, the fill for our letters is from uh, the artist Howard Duina Pindell, who's a black filmmaker, um, painter, archivist and activist. And so watch for that in the spring. Next slide, please. I also released uh, my Nopaming project, which was meant to be a site of Anishinaabe living. It was meant to be a gathering piece and a series of iterations across different media and across different formations. Um, I think of this work as a web or a network or an ecology. Nopaming means in the bush. And for Anishinaabe people, the bush is a gathering site of many different worlds, many different nations of trees, of plants, of animals, of people, the soil, the insect, the water, the air. We gather all together there. And so in Nopaming, I was interested in removing power from the colonial and immersing it once again within the biosphere of Anishinaabe caring. I was interested in making Nopaming an immersive communal engagement in meaning making where together we're continually asking ourselves, what does it mean to be immersed in Anishinaabe living? I released a series of iterations of this project. Nopaming, the cure for white ladies in, at the top of the slide in, in the purple mind map bubble um, is the novel. Um, the next um, 
iteration was the Nell Puming Sessions, which was a collaboration with my sister, who's a singer songwriter and a composer in Toronto named Ansley Simpson. It was Theory of Ice, which is a musical album that was pressed on vinyl and we made CDs, which takes the poetry in the midsection of the novel and converts it to lyrics and sound and brings those ideas in conversation with my band and a host of other musicians, producers and sound engineers. And then this was planned to lead to Theory of Ice, the performance, um, which because of the pandemic has only happened twice <laughs> to an empty theater in Toronto for a streaming performance, part of the Toronto International Festival of Authors and to a sold out crowd of 38 fully vaccinated, socially distanced people in Hamilton, Ontario. So that part of the project, um, which is one of the most important and generative parts for me is actually touring around uh, with my band and, and performing these pieces over and over again in different locations. That's sort of been on, on hold through the pandemic. The next iterations of No Puming are being, oh, yep, are being released now and into the winter, and they're a series of short films or music videos from the tracks of Theory of Ice in collaboration with Black and Indigenous filmmakers. And then the last iteration, which will take some time to make, is a feature length stop motion animation um, by Amanda Strong. So all of these sorts of collaborations um, were meant to be a continuous engagement with the Anishinaabe present and presence and as an Anishinaabe study of life. And here I'm using the term study in a related way to Fred Moten and Stefano Harney and the way Moten talks about study in the undercommons. So moving to the next slide. Um, Moten says, we are committed to the idea that study is what you do with other people. It's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three held under the name of speculative practice. The notion of a rehearsal, being in a kind of workshop, playing in a band, in a jam session, old men sitting on a porch or people working together in a factory. These are various modes of activity. The point of calling it study is to mark that the incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities is already present. So when I think along Moten and Harney about study and in the Anishinaabe way, I think about people living in encampment communities and cities, sharing everything they have with each other. I think about abolition organizers studying with incarcerated people and mobilizing with migrant peoples. I think of language nests and freedom schools, indigenous theaters and friendship centers. I think of Anishinaabe Health's mobile healing unit in Toronto. I think of Dene people setting nets, calling moose and harvesting spruce gum. I think of Anishinaabe tapping trees, harvesting rice and making canoes. I think of trans poets breaking open language and building new possibilities. I think of Inuit musicians performing on Zoom through the pandemic. I think of beavers and moose and pickerel and strawberries. I think of the sound of ice breaking up, geese migrating south and rivers bubbling over rocks. I think of everyone engaged in anti-colonial struggle from Palestine to over Herero lands to Ross River, working, dancing, suffering, as Moten says. What draws me to the way Moten uses this practice of study is that it's about doing, making, action, kinetics, embodiment practices, and that that doing takes place with other people and in my way of thinking with other forms of life. So study is not an individual pursuit because indigenous life is not an individual pursuit. In my own work, Anishinaabe practices require full engagement with one's body, intellect, emotion, and spirit. They are done in reciprocal and responsive ways in commune with other living beings. And it is these practices, these studies, these rehearsals that generate new knowledge. So done well, Anishinaabe study, Anishinaabe practice does more than just generate new knowledge. 
Anishinaabe practice generates worlds that are born out of and exist in sharp opposition to racial capitalism. So there is a refusal embedded in this sort of study, a refusal of the state and capitalism and its endless exponents, a refusal of the violence and the relentless death-making machine of colonialism, an ending of one kind of world. Next slide, please. I'm reminded of this when I'm making dry fish with grandparents who share stories about the precious times, their precious times away from residential schools that were full of joy where they felt free. I'm reminded of this when hunters in the North worry about their caribou relatives in the face of mining and oil and gas exploration. I'm reminded of this sitting around fires when someone takes a muskox rib off the fire and passes it to me and then passes a knife and shortly after a salt shaker. So I'm reminded also of, of Ruthie Wilson Gilmore and her most incisive sort of intervention when she talks about building new worlds by changing everything and invokes the phrase where life is precious, life is precious. Where all life is precious, all life is precious. Black life, indigenous life, trans life, black spruce life, beaver life, river life, mountain life, ocean life, Asian life. And so because our creators made us creators in our studies, we aren't only concerned with thinking. We are concerned with thinking in a way that is mutually interlocking and reciprocally constructed with action, with spirit, and with commune. We are concerned with study by building immersive decolonial spaces where we can plant the seeds for making alternative worlds. These collective embodied practices of world building release and generate the knowledge and the skills we need to build and sustain new ways of being. It can be messy, it can be difficult, mistakes are made. Sometimes things are replicated we don't want to replicate. We create more questions than we answer. The work is relentless and it's never done. It's a struggle. And as the performers and the musicians in the audience know too well, this is what rehearsals are for. This space where deep listening is a cherished practice, where possibility exists, where mistakes and missteps are correctives and opportunity, where repetition is simultaneously relentless and generative, where performativity moves away from empty gesture and back to a practice of rooted in action where the right people in the right room at the right time or on the right Zoom call can produce magic. So I talk about all of this as an introduction to what I was trying to do with the novel and with the ecology of projects around the novel. We could move to the next slide. This is, uh, this is a cover of the book. And I'd like to start with the cover image. Um, in about 2007, I was in Montreal with my partner who was installing um, a piece in a gallery there. And I was taking our kids to the planetarium on a Saturday morning and I'm walking along the street in Montreal and I look up and I see this image on a billboard. And seeing this image actually made me so happy because I was sort of in a stead, I was a, in jogging pants, I was a stay-at-home mom. I had these two toddlers and um, Rebecca Belmore, who is the artist, sort of tapped me on the shoulder through this work and said, I see you. Um, in the next slide, you can see the billboard that I would have seen. Um, it's uh, eight by 24 feet. It's lit at night. It could be seen from both directions of a major freeway going through Montreal. There was no sign that, it, that indicated that this was a work of art. There was no title, there was no signature. And from a distance, it looks stunningly beautiful. And as you travel closer, you can start to see the, the slash and there's no place to sort of rest your gaze. There's no pleasurable image the closer you get. The next slide is a, a close-up. Um, and so the image to me 
felt really androgynous. Um, on one hand, it sort of affirmed the experiences of Indigenous women, trans and queer people. At the same time, it places that violence of colonialism right in front of the viewer where you there's no, there's no opportunity to look away. I liked the stitching. Um, that was a code for me because sewing up the holes, I think in indigenous cultures um, is, is a practice of care and it's a practice of love. And um, so is beating. And that stitching up in the beating was in opposition to the violence of the slash. Um, it reminded me of there's a stage when you're tanning hides uh, where you stitch up all the holes that you've made and it's sort of a, a loving, joyful stage near the end. So ultimately, this to me was just refusing the idea that Indigenous bodies are disposable. And it, it sort of placing it on a billboard spoke to me in a way that this body couldn't be infringed upon, it couldn't be broken, it couldn't be dishonored. Um, the next slide shows sort of the full image. And it also really reminded me of um, Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson's work in a paper that she published in Theory Event called The State as a Man, where Audra writes about the female body or queer bodies as political orders, an embodiment of a political economy, an embodiment of ethics, and a threat to settler sovereignty, and therefore something un that under settler colonialism needed to be eliminated. So the uh, work of Rebecca Belmore and the practice sort of encoded in this image really spoke to me in terms of what I was trying to do in the novel. There are two other works of art um, of Rebecca's. Rebecca is an Anishinaabe artist, um, but there's two other works of hers that were, that were influential in the writing of the, the book. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, those of you who, who have read the book will know that, that the shopping cart um, imagery plays a role in the story. And this is a, a piece, a sculpture of Rebecca's from the exhibition, her solo exhibition in, at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto in 2018 called Facing the Monumental. And if you look sort of in the back of the image, you'll see uh, the second sculpture and the second piece that was influential in Nopaming, and that piece is called tarpaulin. And so these are both monuments that Belmar created to um, the dispossessed. And they speak to a time when she was living in the downtown east side of Vancouver, where she witnessed the impact of urban dispossession in the form of gentrification with rapid condo development and precarious housing. Um, Belmore says, I understood the severity of land as real estate, everything owned, everything for sale, and how in our so-called great cities, the reality of owning anything is out of reach for most of us with no solution in sight. Staring at construction sites of yet another condominium, she recounts, all I could think about was landlessness and those who are without a home. Uh, she also told me about her witnessing the sound of shopping, of the wheels of shopping carts going up and down her street, pushed by people without homes, and how that figured into her Anishinaabe living, and how the shopping cart to these people is home. So Tower is a 15-foot installation of shopping carts that make shift homes for so many, um, stacked up as a shiny condominium, and the carts are filled with locally sourced clay from below the city, and it sort of anchors those uh, carts to the ground. Um, the next slide shows the, the piece tarpaulin. Um, so if you've read the book, there's a lot of tarps. There's a lot of blue tarps in the book. Anishinaabe life is one of movement and kinetics and creation, and our people make homes and ceremonial spaces and teaching lodges out of the materials available to us. And displacement and dispossession are forces that make migrant peoples. There are forces that um, put people in the position of having to make homes out of tents or tarps or whatever materials are available to them. Urban encampments are made out of crisis and protest and a home sometimes is made out of one's own bodies. 
So this um, sculpture is a blanket sized tarp made out of ceramic clay sourced from beneath the city of Winnipeg. And from afar, it looks as if the figure is resting under the tarp, but as the viewer approaches, the tarp is empty. So this is where the idea of sort of incorporating the tarps and the shopping carts as sort of uh, an urban code and an urban aesthetic for, for dispossession uh, in cities came from in the book. The next slide is also related to the title. This is a picture of English born settler and writer, Susanna Moody who was living just north of Peterborough in my territory uh, where I live now um, in 1852. And she wrote a memoir called Roughing It in the Bush. It was a sort of guidebook for British settlers coming into my territory, clearing the land, setting up farms and eventually creating a settler state. The book is canonical in Canadian literature because it is one of the first books written by a woman in Canada. And so authors like Margaret Atwood and Carol Shields have written books inspired by her writing. Susanna Moody even has a commemorative postage stamp. And in Canada, that's sort of the best you can do as a writer. <laughs> um, and of course, of course, this um, pioneer comes into my territory in 1852. My people, the Michisagi Kanishnabek, don't come out very well in the book. Moody's white supremacy made her unable to see our presence, our brilliance in the world and the worlds that we were building. Um, there's also a lot of anti-Black references in the book. And so my title, The Cure for White Ladies, is a reference to roughing it in the bush. It's a speaking back to this. Um, and it's also a study of Anishinaabe presence and presence in the in present time um, in response to sort of this erasure, this settler erasure that has been so much a part of Canadian nation building. Um, I also, though, I didn't want to delve into roughing it in the bush. I read it several times in my life. I wanted to use it just as a jumping off point. I wanted to um, sort of drop it in the, the title and then I don't refer to it again in the book. Um, next slide, please. My idea for this book was I, I was setting out to write um, something in fiction in longer form. So I have two books of short stories and I wanted to figure out how to world build using a longer form, but I quickly encountered how steeped the novel is in Western thought and Western practice, protagonist, antagonist, good versus evil, plot setting conflict. I found those structures very, very hard to work within and it shut down my creativity. So I decided very early on in the project to allow Anishinaabe oral storytelling to be the guide. And that led the book to the book looking very differently structurally. And it ultimately, I think, leads to a very different reading experience. It's a disruption, I think, in the way that we normally read novels. I was interested in this idea of, of time and space coming from a Anishinaabe word for dawn, which is bidaben. And the B part of the word means the future is coming at you. The da means the present or home and ba or ban is a suffix that you would put on the end of someone's name after they had passed. So it denotes the past. So every morning when the sun is coming up, which is often when I'm writing, um, I kind of greet Badabin and it's the present moment created from the past and the future collapsing in on itself. So that for me artistically was really generative in terms of thinking about the kinds of conversations um, that make up the present. And a lot of times um, there's a kind of a big movement in indigenous futurism right now, but I found myself really interested in the present because the present gives birth to the future. So what does, what does an Anishinaabe present look like? I was interested in exploring sort of a really, the really deep relationality that is part of Anishinaabe worldviews and, and ethics and, and how we mm -hmm. form the world. 
um, we often talk about it in a way that's kind of superficial. So I was really looking at having this deep kind of networked web of relationships between plants and animals and humans um, become almost like the setting of the book. That ecosystem of care becomes the setting of the book. Um, and the characters are sort of nodes in that network that are, are composed of, of these relationships that they're in. I wanted to push trauma to the margins. So the main character, the narrator of the piece, Mashkawaji, um, has experienced some sort of trauma, is frozen in the ice at the beginning of the book. Um, but we don't, I don't delve into what that is. So that's sort of a response to a lot of work um, in Canada right now that's being published um, around Indigenous trauma. I wanted to sort of create a space for Indigenous joy and humor um, that was immersive and that felt really amazing for Anishinaabe people to be in. Um, I spent a lot of time kind of recoding property um, as a way of sort of critiquing consumerism. I thought a lot about, did my ancestors have objects that they related to as property? When you have a Ninatek, which is the, the maple tree character um, who moves around traveling to Toronto, traveling back to the bush, pushing a shopping cart, um, how do they relate to that, to that as a belonging? Um, so that was um, tarps and boats and uh, shopping carts. Each character had had sort of a, a list of special things. And that's what that's kind of speaking to. I wanted to um, make a world where there was lots, uh, kind of an expansive experience of gender where the colonial gender binary just wasn't a thing where um, I guess indigenous queer, Anishinaabe queer normativity was, was normal. Um, and I used they, them pronouns for all of the main characters in the book as a way of um, sort of reflecting how the Anishinaabe language works. Um, so we don't have gendered pronouns, um, but then also to, allow readers to have a more expansive experience, reading experience of gender um, and, and check sort of the characters that, that their brain was naturally ascribing um, male or female to. Um, there's a lot of space in the book for those that you have, for those of you that have read it, there's a lot of empty space or quiet. Um, we had a lot of discussion in the um, with the editors around whether that that blank space should be filled with pictures or I should spread the text out in a creative fashion or whether we should not waste all that paper and crunch it all together. Um, but I really <laughs> insisted on having that 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 quiet and and slowing down the reading process, allowing for reflection, allowing for sort of reflecting. Um, when you're talking to kind of old timer Anishinaabe uh, elders, they don't they don't talk a lot. They don't do a lot of chit chat. They speak deliberately. They speak carefully, and there's a lot of silence. And so I wanted to have that kind of um, reflection of quiet and of silence and that old kind of Anishinaabe conversation. Um, I wanted the book to be circular. I wanted you to be able to start actually on any page of the book and read it and be able to get a, a sense of the story because that is how our oral literature works. Um, so oftentimes when an, an elder will tell a story, there isn't a clear beginning, middle and end with a, with a neatly packed away message. Um, there's almost sort of seeds that get scattered that if you pick up those seeds and nurture them over time, you will find the meaning. So I wanted to have a little bit of that. So I, I spent all this time writing the book and then it came time to release the book and the pandemic hit. So um, I started to think about how the work would travel um, 
when no one was traveling. And I got the idea with my sister. Um, next slide, please. That's um, my sister, Ansley. Uh, to do a short album called the Nopaming Sessions, which you can find on Bandcamp um, of electronica that Ansley composed. And uh, I did four readings over the music and we created the Nopaming Sessions. So the next slide shows the cover art, which is by Leanne Charlie, who is a Northern Toshone artist based in Whitehorse. I loved kind of that middle image of a tent, but also a body. So kind of commingling the idea of land and body, body as home, figure as tent frame, um, spoke to the work. And then um, Ansley and I connected with Sammy Chian. Um, the next slide, please. Who is a Taiwanese Canadian immigrant and queer artist of color who is an interdisciplinary artist, director, performer, researcher, and mentor in film and sound art in new media and performance. And we asked them to make a video for the first track on the Nopaming Sessions, which is called Solidification. And it is the very first part of the novel. So one of the things that is a part of my culture is um, when you begin a ceremony or when you begin a gathering, you go in in a, you almost hesitate before you go in. You are kind of aware of the space that you're going into. You don't go in like a bull in a china shop. You go in quietly, you go in with prayer. And so I wanted to have the beginning of the book sort of um, starting with poetry as a, a kind of soft, gentle beginning. And so Sammy was really interested in how the meaning coded in the sonics of solidification unlocked movement and knowledge in the body. And so they used a computer program called Isadora, which enables artists to create performance performances and installations where video, sound and light react interactively to sensory input. So for those of you who are not musicians, um, when we record music, you record a series of stem files where you record one instrument at a time. So I sent all those files to Sammy. Um, they wrote code and took the frequencies of those stems and generated imagery from the code that they wrote. And then they edited that together. And so they created the video that we'll watch at the end of, of this presentation called Solidification. And then there's this really beautiful part because Sammy was of, of course under stay at home orders as well. Um, and he reached out to his dad, Jackson, who's a traditional Taiwanese woodblock carver. And Jackson did a, a woodblock carving of solidification in Taiwanese. And I included the word solidification in the Anishinaabe syllabus. So you'll see that in the film. That was a, a, a beautiful part of the pandemic when artists created art with their families because that's the only people that you were around. Um, next slide, please. The, so that's, um, you can see the woodblock carving and the uh, Anishinaabe syllabics there. And we'll take a look at that, that film, that short film at the end. Um, next slide. The next project is Theory of Ice, which was put out um, by You've Changed Records. It's six tracks from the middle part of Nopaming, that poetry section, um, plus OK and Dykes, and then a cover of Willie Dunn's I Pity the Country. And this is definitely the piece of the project that has traveled the farthest into the mainstream. And I it's I don't even know why, really. It, it got an excellent review by Pitchfork. It was shortlisted for the Polaris Prize in, in Canada. Um, one of the tracks was used in Hockey Night in Canada. So again, that's, that's like the postage stamp in Canada. Um, and the cover art here is by Anishinaabe artist Nadia Meyer. Um, it's called Orison 4. And Nadia, um, in 2000, about 2014, beaded the Indian Act, which is a piece of legislation in Canada that governs the lives of Indians from, from birth to, to the grave. 
and um, she beaded each page of the Indian Act and then took photos of the back. And so this is one of the photos of the back of the Indian Act. And I love the threads and the connections and the, the connections of, of, uh, of the beads. And so that became the um, cover art for the album. We then did a series of short films, not really music videos, because um, the aesthetics are really, really different than I think what you see in music videos. And the first one was done by Sandra Brewster. If we could move to the next slide. Sandra is a Canadian visual artist based in Toronto, um, and her practice is recognized for her community-based um, practice that centers Black presence in Canada. And she's just had an amazing solo exhibition at the Art Gallery of Ontario called Blur. And so Sandra um, made a video again in the pandemic with her iPhone um, in the Leslie Spit Park in Toronto, which is a uh, one of the settings for, for Nopaming. And her short film explored Black and Indigenous land-based politics. So there's a still from, from that film in the next slide. We were able to screen this over Zoom at an event at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And it was also up on the blog at the DIA in New York for a, for a bit. Um, the next short film was by Asin Ayuk, who is an Inuk visual artist, writer, and filmmaker from mm -hmm. Nunavik. And um, just moving to the next slide, Asinayak um, did a video for OK and Dykes. And then the next one is, uh, the next slide is Amanda Strong, or that's, sorry, that's OK and Dykes. These you can all find on YouTube. Um, they don't stream well, so we're just gonna stream one tonight um, because of, of time, but you can check them out on YouTube. Um, and. Theory of Ice is, is available on all the streaming platforms. Um, the next slide is of Breakup. Breakup hasn't been released yet. We just did the credits today for that video. It's um, a stop motion animation and it's a uh, um, sort of a test piece for a larger stop motion animation based on the novel, the opening. So this will be really, ex this is really exciting. I haven't seen the final cut, but you start to see Mashkawaje coming to life, Sabe coming to life um, in a, in a, a world making of, of stop motion animation. Um, and we will, I worked with Amanda on a, a short film called Bidabin. Um, if you move to the next slide, I think that's a, a picture of, of Badabin. So that's, um, Sabe is a reoccurring character from uh, my first two books. And so there will be some continuity between Nopaming the, the film and, uh, and Badabin. And then finally, um, we released in just in December a video by Carolyn Monet, who is in another Anishinaabe filmmaker. She did Head of the Lake. If we move to the next slide, um, I think this is one of my favorite ones and you can, you can find that on YouTube as well. And then the next slide is just a, a photo of um, Carolyn Monet in the top left, Amanda Strong in the top right, and then Lisa Jackson, who is another Anishinaabe filmmaker. Um, and she's working on uh, a film, the short film for I Pity. So I really, I, I have trouble writing novels that just stay in books. And I love writing because I love building worlds where I can make all the decisions. And then I love taking those worlds and collaborating with um, a whole host of other artists from other communities, from other medians and, and watching the ideas travel and shift. And so that was the idea uh, behind Nopaming as a gathering site. I expected, <laughs> I expected that I would be able to gather people um, and I expected I would be able to gather artists together uh, while we worked with each other and the pandemic took care of that. But 
we we sort of shifted and uh, we're able to do something a little different. So now we're going to watch um, solidification, which is short, and then we'll come back and we'll have uh, questions and, and discussion. Once you move through cold, there is Pacific. Once you move through Pacific, there is Placid. Once you move through Placid, there is a condition of expanse. And it was in that condition of expanse that held me. I heard them singing above me. Mashkawaje fell through the ice to find quiet to get out of the wind, to visit with Namegos. They all sang, Mashkawaje stitches up the hole. They are so cold, they can't move. They are frozen stiff. The lake is their blanket. They all sang, Mashkawaje is frozen stiff. Still, calm. No one knows if they're coming back. They all sang. Akewenze is fishing through the ice with a spear. They brought a line of beads. They will wait patiently. They will wait until Mashkawaje is done their visit. The singing and drumming came every night from a distance. Different choirs every evening at dusk marking the passage of time, reminding me there is still love. You see, tragedy happened again. The details don't matter because the details are hopeless, overwhelmed, shut down. Know this, after two years, the best parts of me are still frozen in the lake. My limbic system, its best friend, the prefrontal cortex, and the hollow, pumping organ in which I keep benevolence. The only one that regularly comes to visit is Akuenze. In the winter, they park their truck on the ice, drill a hole with the auger and fish until the cold makes their bones crack. As soon as the ice is off the lake, Akawenze is back in their boat with a torch and a sort of pitchfork for spearing pickerel. In the dead of summer, Akawenze sneaks back before first light in their canoe, before their cottagers and their jet skis are out. In the fall, they sprinkle tobacco around me and sing. My world is muted. I look out. If something upsets me, I just wait, and the upset passes. I sit beside. Sometimes I remember the other me, before I was frozen in the lake. I remember caring and engaging, and the sharpness of unmuted feeling. I remember a hopeless connection. I don't feel stuck, in part because I don't feel anything. Their song isn't wrong. The ice is like a warm, weighted blanket. My form dissolved when tragedy came, and if I am fluid, the ice is container. There are ashes in my eyes. I am so far inside myself, like Miss Squadesi on a full fast inside time, pulled inside their organs, inside their turtle shell, inside the sediments of the lake, while the ice world forms on top, oblivious to the outside with body as lake. And there is solace in being cut off, and there is freedom enmeshed within that state. Know this, being frozen in the lake is another kind of life, 
It is unclear how long before I will be done with my visit. It is unclear how long visiting takes. Know this. Visiting is more of a dance than an event. A coenze is my will. The Nautic is my lungs. Mindemoya is my conscience. Sabe is my marrow. A dick is my nervous system. A sin is my eyes and ears. Lucy is my brain. I believe everything these seven say because ice distorts perception and trust replaces critique, examination, interrogation. I believe everything these seven say, even though, even though. I believe everything these seven say, even though their truths are their own, not mine. I believe in the absence of my own heart, I will accept the hearts of these seven. The keys fly overhead in the sheer grace of a carefully angled formation designed to take them elsewhere. There are still stars. There are still stars. Um, thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Um, such a, a stunning, stunning work um, that really just enacts the kinetics of all the things that um, you were theorizing in your talk, and then also um, the, the act of study and practice and ceremony um, that Nukeming takes uh, in, in the written form. Um, just really, really lovely. Um, and thinking about how the, uh, the work opens with this, this figure in the ice, um, the unnamed trauma that we know is there, um, but also the way that they are thinking about that time with the ice as a visit, um, as a dance. Um, and, and for me, it, 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 uh, I, can't, I can't help but think about um, really perhaps what the work is gesturing to is the healing power of ice, the necessity of ice, the beauty of ice, how important it is, um, and then also water and the lake. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how how you're engaging or how you're thinking about ice, either in, in, in this particular instance or kind of kind of through the work a little a little bit more. I started thinking about the ice um, because I I work in the north um, in Denende and I had the opportunity to spend six weeks on the land. A number of times actually now where the lake is melting or freezing and there's like beautiful sonics that come out of that. Um, your relationship with the water changes over time. Um, and, and of course, when the ice is breaking up, there's this like incredible renewal of life. And so that was one of the influences. Another influence was sort of this idea that sometimes with trauma, um, one of our responses is that we become shut down and you, you go really far inside yourself and you have to rely on 
your your family or your friends or or the relationships that are around you for for that caretaking um, to find out information about the world. So for me, being frozen in the ice, I thought was a really calming, safe, protective um, sort of healing space. When I had written it into the book, the editors who were non-Indigenous were like, this seems so awful. Like this seems, this doesn't, they, that didn't um, come through for them. So I had to, I think part of that was cultural and part of it, I, I rewrote um, that beginning part a few times so that that would come through. Sometimes there is a, you have to retreat, you have to create a refuge. Um, your body shuts down or your emotions shut down for a period of time and you have this reliance. And so I was thinking about, you know, in the violence of ongoing colonialism, you often don't have the supports, that care network necessarily that's able to hold space for you. But um, what if we did? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, when I read it and, and spend time with it, um, I think of it as so loving, so caring, such a wonderful mm. space to be um, with the ice. And I think um, perhaps that is kind of a cultural orientation. And I also think about what people do in the winter, you know, we're kind of hunkering down, you know, staying in your teepee, staying in your, your house, um, just kind of resting and being with the cold. Um, and so I feel like the, the, the work really encapsulates that. And then what's so beautiful to kind of um, speak to these um, ecologies that the work creates that you were theorizing in your talk, um, even though uh, um, Mashkawaje is um, alone theoretically, or at least not around other beings, but they're around the water. Um, the, there's these connections that are being forged with these other parts of their body. And so the work is already kind of creating these webs and networks of kind of relations that then unfold um, throughout the work. So just really, really, um, really lovely. I guess there wasn't quite a question in there, but more so just attempting um, to, to think through them. Um, but I, um, I, yeah, I was wondering if you could um, kind of expound a little bit or, or um, yeah, reflect on um, kind of these relations between kind of Black radical tradition, um, Indigenous, and you um, are kind of putting forth this idea of Nishinaabeg study. And I think it's really lovely kind of anti-colonial work um, that, that you're, you're, you're enacting and then also kind of forming this, this genealogy, so to speak. Um, and, um, yeah, like how, how you think about perhaps your, your arts practice with the other people you collaborate with as kind of being a form of this Nishinaabeg study um, that is a, a, is, is a collective endeavor um, in its own right, like kind of enacting it. Yeah, so I think one of the things coming from sort of a Native studies or an Indigenous studies space is that sometimes because the loss from colonialism is so magnificent, the magnitude of the loss is so big that you just want to focus in on Anishinaabe. You just want to focus in on North America. You just want to focus in. And when I think about Anishinaabe intellectual practices, because they're networked and because they're about relationships, um, all of those old stories were, were about were planetary, they were global in orientation, they were about international relations. So what can I learn from the Hawaiians who are so close to the ocean and volcanoes? What can I learn from um, indigenous peoples in Africa? What can I learn from the Inuit who um, are living in a very, very different environment than the Anishinaabe? So I wanted to sort of base, be, be sort of strongly in Anishinaabe in my orientation, but I wanted to engage with the anti-colonial peoples and indigenous peoples of the world. And I don't think that I can fully understand genocide and what's happened to indigenous people without understanding um, the genocide of, of black peoples and transatlantic slavery and the afterlives of that. And so um, by engaging in a practice that is deliberately international, um, by reading widely, by reading outside of those sorts of um, disciplines, by detonating those disciplines and genre, I think that um, that's been a very generative space for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I really love how your work um, so often 
um, can be thought of as a conversation between artists and a conversation between intellectuals, um, uh, especially um, indigenous uh, female artists, uh, queer indigenous um, uh, artists and thinkers as well. Um, and I, I just love how you, you know, you, you um, are speaking of how you have trouble writing a novel that stays like in the form of the novel on the page and it has all these kind of network relations um, and all that is just kind of mirrored in, in all the, the things that are created around it. Um, but to kind of think, think about maybe some of the, um, the relationalities that are um, being, being imagined and practiced in uh, Nukaming um, the, the book, um, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about the unseated nation under the Gardener um, Expressway, because um, I, I was thinking about unhoused people um, and the, these spaces of um, precarity and collectivity um, and how the, the characters in the work are creating these loving bonds. They're connecting with one another, connecting with the ecologies um, in the face of all of these um, devastating structures um, and, and practices. Um, and yeah, how, how, how are you, yeah, I guess, yeah, what are, what are your, um, the ways you're thinking about this, this unseated nation um, under, under the expressway for, for people who maybe haven't spent time with the, the book? It started sort of as an exploration of this, um, the polarity of, of the reservation or the reserve and urban, um, urban environments and urban geographies and the assumptions that are sort of attached to that, that um, reservations and reserves are, are these um, places where you get lots of, of culture and indigenous ethics and, and tradition and cities are kind of wastelands in terms of indigenous people. And so I wanted to sort of push back a little bit um, around those assumptions because in Canada so often, it's been queer indigenous people, it's been indigenous women um, through the Indian Act that have had to leave um, First Nations communities and, and go to the city and build um, families and communities and networks in the city. And so I wanted to visibilize indigenous presence in urban areas in all kinds of different ways and sort of also, um, break down this idea that um, cities aren't indigenous space because of course it is it, it is um, under the gardener in Toronto is Mississauga Anishinaabeg space and is is Haudenosaunee space so there um, there is a presence there that is continually erased and sort of that Rebecca Belmore was speaking about in gentrification uh, her gentr anti-gentrification work as well so I wanted to sort of bring um, bring to life those worlds um, where you might see lots of, of people with precarious housing, um, with food insecurity. Um, you might find a lot of, a lot of different kinds of, of animal life, different kinds of plant life, but an enactment and a practice of, of Indigenous ethics around sharing and care. Mm 